This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. Haley Buick GMC. The place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. On Midlothian Turnpike in Richmond and online at haleybuickgmc.com. Taking it to the streets and helping our community. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to Elizabeth Rice. Tell our viewers we're going back to the 1960s, Richmond, Virginia, February. You were very much involved in something that was happening here in the city. Yeah. Start us off with telling us what was happening. All right. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for your invitation. Um, February 22nd, 1960 was George Washington's birthday. I remember that. Ah. And they were having big sales and what have you. But of course, during that time, sit-ins were occurring all over the nation. And uh, Greensboro is kind of where it started. And I was the student at Virginia Union University in Richmond at that time. And I remember sitting around the breakfast table this particular morning with my mother and my father, who were very active in the city. My mother was a professor father was a dentist and um, they said we know that things are going on in the around the country but uh, they called me Betty Betty was my everybody called me Said Betty we don't want you to be getting involved we heard that something might be happening here in Richmond Virginia and we want you to go to school and do get your studies and I said I assured them I said of course I'm gonna go to class I'm not, not gonna be doing anything else so I left the breakfast table with all the intent of going to class, and I, and I walked to uh, Virginia Union University. I was living there on North Side and Griffin Avenue at the time, and we walked on over to the campus, and there was a lot of little murmuring and different little groups getting together at the campus, and I said, I wonder what's going on. And so I was hearing that, you know, they're going to march on Tallheimers today. And I thought about what they said at the table. I said, well, I, I'm going to go to class. And so, but nobody was going to class. Everybody was out all right. there. Okay. So all of a sudden, they, I saw the lines forming. Now, I wasn't a leader. Or Pinkston and Sherrod were the leaders there of, of, that, of that particular uh, march that was getting ready to occur. And so I noticed that everybody was getting in line, getting the picket signs. So it was definitely, definitely planned. And before I knew it, I just got caught up in it. Don't ask me where my books went. But I got in line. And there were about 200 of us that marched that day from Lombardi all the way down to Tallheimers on Broad Street. And first of all, we were just picketing around the building. And then someone said, we're going in. And I said, oh my goodness, now I was picking and now they're talking about going in. And so I went on in. <laughs> so I went in with all, all 200, of course, didn't go in, but most of them did. And I sat, took a seat 
at the lunchroom counter right there on Broad Street. And <clears throat> several of them followed. And we were sitting there and we were getting, you know, some names. We were being called names at that time by some of the people shopping in the store. And, of course, the waitresses at the lunchroom counter. And uh, we were looking at each other and we were taught nonviolence. Martin Luther King had come to the campus on numerous occasions with Abernathy, and we had been taught nonviolence, as he was instructed, of course, and taught by Mahatma Gandhi that if you are slapped, you do not slap back, you, you are to turn the other cheek, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. what we were taught. And so that's what it was going to be, a nonviolent participation. And so anyhow, and there, here we are sitting around the lunchroom counter, some went to the restaurant on the upper level, the tea room. Yes. And right. um, we were sitting there looking at each other, and no one was saying a word. Everybody was in deep thought as to what's going to happen. All of a sudden, the police wagons pull up, because I could see it from outside the window. They pull up, and I remember the police in their brown uniforms and the, and the leather built cap and all that's very distinct to me. And then I remember the, the German Shepherd dogs with them, and they were holding the dogs. And then I flashed back to the TV reports that I'd seen about all the violence and, and how they'd been hit with billy clubs and the fire hose. And I just said, oh, I hope nothing like that's going to happen. And so they came into the lunchroom counter, and... Um, they said, you're under arrest, you're trespassing, and we want you to leave. No one said anything, no one moved. And the police came in, and I remember sitting on the counter where I was, on the uh, chair that I was sitting, I remember this German Shepherd dog sniffed me near the leg, and I was praying, please don't let this dog bite me. And I was also thinking about what are my parents gonna say, look at what I'm doing here. They just, I told them I'd be in class, I'm not in class. So soon, they said, if you don't leave now, we're going to arrest you. And so we were pulled off of the seats. We weren't, no billy club was used. No, no one got bitten by the dog. We were pulled off and put in the wagons. And we, we went, you know, we kind of followed the police's lead. Got into the wagons. And we didn't know where we were going. They said, oh my gosh, we're going to jail. So what we did then was we were there quietly. No one was speaking in the wagon because I don't think we realized just what we'd done. And so when they opened up the wagon, there was the jailhouse door, maybe that little side door, and we were ushered into the jailhouse. And I remember the fingerprinting, and I don't remember much more except going into the jail, into the cell. And I remember that still noise of the door being shut. And I said, oh my goodness, I am in jail. I cannot believe I'm in jail. Well, how long am I going to be here? What's going to happen? And we weren't in there for too long. I, I would say maybe an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour, when all of a sudden a person comes back and says, you're free to go. You can go. Your bail has been paid. I said, well, who in the world paid the bail, and where am I going to go, and who's going to meet me? So we get out of jail, and we go outside that same door, I think, that we came in. And there are lines and lines of people lined up the street, blocks and blocks of people in cars parked. And they are clapping and applauding and, and giving a high five, and, and we were wondering, what's going on? And we were kind of ushered to these cars. Well, we didn't know, I didn't know whose car I was getting into, but <laughs> I felt that it wasn't, wasn't that intimidating, and I got into the cars, all of us did. And we got into these cars, and people were yelling, and, and, and they, looked, they had smiles on their faces, and it didn't really register what had happened. And we got to the Eggleston Hotel. That's where the cars took us. We got to the Eggleston Hotel, and there were people outside of the Eggleston Hotel, and we were ushered into the hotel, into this big room, and there were professors and students and, I guess, 
strangers and just anybody who could get in there. And they were just, you know, clapping as we mm. came through the door. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, at that point, realized, I said, we must have done something good. Something must have happened that day that made a difference. I mean, why else are they clapping? Why are they smiling? And so before long, I looked over, looking for my mother or my father, and wondering, guess what, was what that was going to solidify it for me. Based on their expression, I right. know whether I'd done something right. right. And, of course, across the room, I saw my mother. She had a smile on her face. And I saw my father with his hands behind his back. Mm -hmm. And he was, I could tell he was proud of what had happened. And, you know, from there, um, you know, things happened you know, right. years later. Well, now, now, I know you're writing a book and, and you're speaking in different schools and places, but take another two or three minutes and fast forward 50 years later, 50th anniversary, okay. 2010, right. because something very unique happened that day after that celebration. Right. You right. had someone come up and talk well, to you. between that time, I was a teacher in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. And I realized that, boy, in 1960, we did all this, and I think we made a difference. And there were 34 of us arrested that day, 34. There were 200 and some that left in the march, and, and you know, 34 were arrested. It was the first mass civil rights arrest in history, but no one has really, really recorded it that way. And I said, no one's ever called us back. No one's acknowledged the fact that it happened February 22nd. So anyhow, I happened to come home from school one day, and it was like divine intervention. It was like God was saying, well, if no one else is going to recognize you guys, why don't you get something started? And so I did. It was that. It was just like that. I grabbed the phone minutes later, and I said, who do I call? I called the police department of <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. I said, I'm Elizabeth Johnson Rice. I was in the sit-ins, I was arrested in 1960, and I would like to start a commemoration march to recognize what we did. And could I do this? And he said, of course, man, that's a wonderful idea. Got me in touch with the park police. Then I called Virginia Union and talked to a Dr. Raymond Hilton, the historian. And from there, I just took the ball, and I, mm -hmm. and I, and I did it. I said, we're going to happen. It happened on t in 2004. So from then to 2004, the commemoration march took place. We got a proclamation to do it. I got people involved, and it was, a, it was broadcast that we were going to march. I called the newspapers, and I think I called the TV stations. And I do know after all this great thing, all these great things happened, um, I saw this cute little white girl standing out in front because we did it right in front of Tall Harmon's store. It had not been torn down at that time. And after everything was over, um, I think Senator Marsh then was there and, and you know, the mayor and a lot of people that were civil rights activists in the city. After it was all over, she came up to me and she said, you don't know me, but I was very touched by everything that's happened today. And I just want you to know that that um, the man that arrested you, William Tallheimer, was my grandfather. And my name is Elizabeth Tallheimer Smart. And um, I know that it's been, it'll, it'll be 50 years soon before it's the 50th anniversary. And I would love to do anything I can to be a part of that celebration. And uh, at that time, I gave away certificates, my, my organization be part of the solution, gave away certificates to all the people that had made things, made a change in the city. And I had a, believe it or not, I had a certificate to William Tallhammers at the time. I don't know why I did it, but I said, well, he made a difference because if it hadn't happened, things wouldn't have progressed. So everything has a reason. And I said, well, you give this certificate to your grandfather. And he was still alive then. She said, I certainly will. And later, Elizabeth told me she wrote her book, Finding Tallheimers. Later, she told me that she gave that certificate to her grandfather, and he had tears. And that just kind of choked me up to say, gee, look how far we've come. Here I now am communicating with the granddaughter, and to this day, 
she calls me Biggie. I call her Little League because she's Elizabeth and I'm Elizabeth. And we, you know, we communicated, you know, that much. I wanted her to be here, but she's got her two children and has so much on her plate. She couldn't be here, but she wanted me to extend her best wishes to you. And maybe at another date we'll get together. But things are progressing, and it's it's just because you 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 took the time to make a difference. And I just spoke last week. Someone found me on the internet, and I was invited to speak to these fourth graders at the Robius Elementary School in Chesterfield. And they asked me, would I come? I said, of course I'll come. That was one of the most outstanding, inspiring situations I've ever been in. And I went into that school, and the teacher said, uh, Miss Jackie O'Toole was her name, she said, the students are waiting for you, Ms. Rice. And so I didn't know what that meant. And so they ushered me into the library. And in the library, 120-some children were sitting on this carpet. And they, they were quiet. They were waiting for me to come in to talk to them. And I said, what a responsibility. And so I walked. They ushered me up to the front of the room. And there was a rocking chair waiting for me to sit in to tell them about my experiences. They had been studying a chapter on civil rights and all of that. They knew everything, but I asked them questions about what is civil rights and what happened and who was Mahatma Gandhi. And they knew it. They had done their work. They'd done their homework. And they were there waiting for me, and I gave the story. And it was such an exchange. One little girl, I remember asking me, a question. Mrs. Rice, if you had been white during the time of the civil, of the sit-ins, would you have done anything different? I said, wow, a fourth grader asking me this question. Right. What a question. <clears throat> and I said, I probably would have done the same thing, but your question is very interesting because you all are at a point where you can decide to have diversity in your life or you can decide to just be in the same little mundane group. I said, you get to, God, you've got to get to know people. You can't have fear. You've got to learn. I said, look beside each one of, of your classmates here. Look to the sides, look to behind, and look at them carefully because they could be the next Nobel Prize, Prize winner, the next president, the next person that finds a cure for something. You don't know who you're sitting beside and who you're in the midst of. You all are all great people but the greatness will come as you mature. I said, so get to know people. And then one little, one little person said, uh, Ms. Rice, I've kind of calculated your age. <laughs> These were some smart fourth graders. They said, and we know that if you were doing something during the 60s and da 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 da, you're getting ready to be, uh, you're getting ready to be 75 soon. So have you done all you're gonna do? Is that it? This it for you? <laughs> Mind you, these were fourth graders. I said, oh, heavens no, I'm writing a book, and the best is yet to come. And if I can say that, if someone about to be 75, what does that say to you fourth graders? I said, you've got a lot in, uh, in front of you. I said, you're great people. I love you. I said, I wish you the best. Listen to your teachers. Stay in school. And hopefully I'll come back to see you one day when my book is finished and we'll have a book signing. And they said, well, we look forward to it. And at the, as I concluded my speech with them, I was compelled to have them say, I want you to shout something out loud to me, for me, and I want you to remember what you're saying. And I had everybody in that library, which is supposed to be silent, I had a hundred and some students yell, I love my life. I said, I want you to love your life. Love who you are. And whatever you are, you can make it better. And with that, they came up after it was all over. We took pictures. They gave me hugs. They gave me, I mean, it was just an exchange. They became my children. And I realized then what my purpose and passion is in life right now. And it is to be the bridge. Like I see the, co the connections. Yes, yes. I am the connecting point between the old and the new. And to, to bring history alive. And so as long as I'm here, I'll be doing that on the college campus, in the elementary school, wherever I'm invited to speak. 
to the program like you have right here. I'm so excited to have the opportunity. And I thank you for it. Well, Elizabeth Rice, we thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond. We hear a lot of talk around the Capitol about standards of learning, about what kids are learning. Yeah. And they learn that, but when they can have living history yes. as a part of their classroom experience, uh, it's, it's great. So uh, I'm not your agent. We'll tell folks <laughs> that. But I tell you, I hope that you get many opportunities to be in schools throughout the Commonwealth. Yes. And yes. To, to, so that they can meet you and hear your story and thank you, so thank you again for being thank on this week in Richmond. Me. Enjoyed it. Thank you. I'd like to welcome another notable Virginian and Richmonder, one who's done a great deal of work here in the Commonwealth, uh, Dr. Reed, Dr. William Ferguson Reed, appreciate your being with us. And uh, as we close out this segment that you've had a chance to watch uh, as it was being recorded, I'd like to, to start a conversation with your talking some about uh, your reflections on those demonstrations and sit-ins. And then we're going to do, uh, tell our viewers, they're just going to see a little bit of you for this show, but then we're going to be doing another show that they'll see the following week. Sure. And we'll, we'll talk about your experiences in the General Assembly. But back in the, those times leading up to that demonstration, uh, who are some of the people that come back to your mind, too, that were instrumental in that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when we heard that the students were sitting in, all of us were elated and grateful but to them. Uh, the problem came up, how are we going to get them out of jail? Uh, should we go ahead and institute a boycott of tall hammers? Uh, so uh, many of us uh, decided that we would uh, go on bail for them. And the problem was whether or not to continue it uh, as a boycott. Uh, the, at that time, the crusade was very active in politics along with the NAACP. Uh, NAACP was not able to do it because the General Assembly was trying to put them out of business. Uh, the General Assembly was demanding the list of their members uh, because the uh, NAACP was the, uh, pr the group that started the school desegregation cases. So the NAACP had its uh, plate full uh, the Crusades say it did not want to be responsible for organizing the boycott, but we were able to uh, get a separate organization just to run the boycott, to get people to volunteer to go down uh, to, uh, at specific times to boycott Tallhammers. Uh, and so a, a group was formed at that time, uh, Pikett, who was the executive director of the uh, Black Education Association kind of took over the leadership of that group. Uh, they set up uh, schedules. They're able to solicit people to come down to Tall Amazon and walk around the building uh, in the form of a picket. So we were delightful that the students started it, and we were able to pick up and continue it until it was finally resolved. You, we talked earlier, and you said that it approached the crusade right. about, about doing it. Uh, our viewers might be interested why the crusade uh, passed on that opportunity. Well, at the crusade was formed uh, just to do certain specific things. Voter registration, voter education, and get out the boat. Uh, we did not want to get s sidetracked to other endeavors. And I think that's the problem that many organizations face. Uh, you have one issue you can get all of the people behind that issue, but when you take up another issue, you divide your group. Some don't want to be involved in a boycott. Some don't want to, do want to be involved. So I find that if you have an organization with a specific issue in mind, that they should not be pulled aside uh, into side issues because then you're going to have confusion and you're going to have dissension within the organization. So if the same people were involved, but it was under a different name because in the community at that time, the same people were involved in all of these civil, right, civil rights activities. So 
Uh, it's just a wheel within a wheel. Dr. Reed, thank you, and we'll tell our viewers that in this coming week, they will see another show with you, and so we ask them to tune back in next week to hear more of, of what you can tell about the, the living history. Thank you so very much for inviting me. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. Haley Buick GMC, in Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.